The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this SPSM webinar. This is webinar number three out of an eight-part webinar series by the Faculty for Tomorrow Task Force. You can find a recording of the first two webinars at stsm.org under online courses and then webinars, and then you can look for our Faculty for Tomorrow webinar series. Um, this is the third in the series, and my name is Emily Walters. I'm on staff here at STFM, and we've got some great panelists lined up for our session today. Um, our our uh, webinar today is on professional identity and boundaries. Faculty for Tomorrow Task Force is a um, two-year initiative to address the shortage of family medicine faculty. Some of those goals are to provide resources and training for new faculty, including those moving from private practice to family medicine education. We also want to identify and support young family physicians with leadership potential, ensure that leaders of institutions understand the time and competencies required to be faculty, and expand SCFM's formal faculty recruiting efforts for residents. Faculty for Tomorrow is also supported by the American Board of Fam the Family Medicine Foundation and the SCFM Foundation. Without to go ahead and um, have our panelists introduce ourselves. And here you are. Um, hi, I'm Sarah Marks. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Kansas Medical Center in Kansas City. I do most of my work in our division of medical student education, but I work with our residents as well. Yeah, this is Randall Wright. I am the director of behavioral sciences at the St. Mary's Family Medicine Residency in Grand Junction, Colorado. Uh, we are a community-based residency with a semi-rural focus, and we also train medical family therapy fellows. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tim Dahlman. I'm a professor of family medicine at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And for eight years prior to June, I was the vice chair of the department responsible for the operations of our clinical and academic enterprise. Wonderful. Thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to hear what you all have to say. Um, just to let everyone who's attending know, if you have any comments or questions, there's a dialog box um, with GoToWebinar is our software that we're using. You can submit questions. We have um, designated times that will read out some of those questions. So go ahead and as you think of them, you can submit those to me and I'll share them with our panelists. And with that, I'll turn it over to Randall for the overview of our webinar. Yes, welcome. We're so happy to have you here with us today. Um, so we are talking today about um, the roles and uh, relationships that develop between um, faculty and residents or medical students in the family medicine environment. Um, this will include a discussion of professional identity formation, kind of how we develop as, as faculty, um, how do we balance the roles um, that we play in the lives of residents and students, and then what are the nature uh, of these boundaries and um, how do we make sure that we're staying in a kind of a, a safe professional zone and not um, straying into areas that might end up um, causing uh, stress for us or, or even problems for our career. Okay, so uh, thanks to, to everyone who participated in a survey in advance. Um, we sent out a survey and we got responses from five medical school faculty and 13 residency faculty um, asking about these questions just to kind of get a sense of who people are and what their beliefs are. And the first question was, when you look at your professional identity, how concordant is your current role as a physician educator with the responsibilities and expectations of your program? And then this question here, a higher score would be more concordant, and a lower score would be more discordant. And uh, the average score is 4.76, indicating that um, these are kind of in the middle, higher in the middle, um, indicating some level of discordance, that people have some level of concern with um, their, their role and expectations of the program. Uh, the second question was, how frequently do you think relational conflicts arise due to the multiple roles of faculty. And in this one, um, people were, were concerned about um, role conflicts. Uh, again, it was in the middle of the road, um, but I had anticipated there would be a, a lower reporting level of conflict. Um, and so some people are saying, you know, I, there are some, I get put in some tough spots as it relates to um, 
my roles with residents. And then the last question was, how confident are you in your ability to maintain appropriate professional boundaries as a faculty? And this one was more positive, that people felt like they generally are able to um, maintain professional boundaries themselves. So kind of in, in, in my take on this, it would be that uh, people have a good sense of themselves and their boundaries, but do have some concerns about um, conflicts that can arise um, in general in their residency or, or teaching setting. So we're going to do a couple of polls this morning, and I'm going to pass it off to Sarah for that. Oh, sorry, Emily. That's right. Yeah, so we've got a few, um, actually, uh, three really quick polls. We want to get to know you a little bit. We're excited that you're here, and we want to know um, what types of challenges you're facing and who you are. So what I'm going to do is there's actually a poll question that will pop up for you. I'm going to go ahead and launch it, and I'm going to give you a few minutes to let us know who you are and um, what just kind of go ahead and vote and let us know who's attending and what kind of issues we might be facing. We'll give it a few moments here while everyone gets their votes in. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close that poll. Thank you. for uh, That was a great uh, number of you who all voted. Um, and now you can see our results here. Um, it looks like, oh, that's pretty interesting. We've got a lot of residency faculty attendance, 59%, also some med school faculty at 24%, and seven residents. Thank you for, for attending. I'm a, I think this will be a really great program for you. And we've got some non-faculty members. Um, and I just think that um, what we've got prepared for you will apply to um, many, many of you and your concerns. So that's great that we've got some variety here. All right. Um, if we can advance one more screen, we're also kind of curious, for those of you who are faculty or are not yet faculty, we'd like to go ahead and get your, your take on what your current role is. So I'm going to go ahead and share this second poll with you. Oops, sorry, a little technical difficulty there. I needed to um, share a different poll. Now I'm launching this one for you. Um, so now you have the ability to vote for this one. Give you a few seconds there. Looks like thank you all. They're getting a really high participation rate here, and I do appreciate that. It's just nice to know who's who's on the call. I'm going to go ahead and close that now and share the results. And right here we've got we've got a nice wide variety too, quite a range as far as 34% um, who are in their first year of being a faculty. Um, um, a good number, of, another third of you are faculty members for two to five years. Um, we've got some 5 to 10 years and some 10 plus years, so um, that's really um, helpful to know that as well. And last but not least, last part of getting to know you a little bit here, we've got um, if you're a physician faculty member, are you a faculty member at the same location where you're a resident? Because I do think that's a very interesting question. Give you a few moments to get your votes in before I share the results of that with you as well. And I think we've gotten all set here. So I'm going to go ahead and close this poll again and share the results. And here we are. Um, looks like interesting. So about 50% are not working at the same location where you're a resident, and yet 21% um, are. And I think that that's a really fascinating um, circumstance to try to kind of figure out how to navigate that. So without further ado, we'll keep going. And over to you, Randall. And I believe this is going to be uh, Tim's section, right? That's it. Oh, that's right. I'm so sorry. Yes, that is absolutely who's going to do that. Great. What I'd like to do is provide a little bit of a foundation and understanding when we talk about professionalism, and professional identity that I think will sort of lead into some of the work that Randall's done and some of the comments that Sarah will have later on in the webinar. And we think about professionalism, it's a concept that's really been around for the last two decades. And you, you can't pick up JAMA, the New England Journal, Annals of Family Medicine, I think, in the last decade when this sort of idea of professionalism has, has sort of come to the, the forefront among different stakeholders, whether medical students, among residents, among uh, practicing physicians as well. And this concept more specifically about professional identity comes out of a group of McGill in Canada, and Richard Cruz to be specific. And it's received a little bit of attention, but I think sort of gaining ground of how do you begin to conceptualize that. 
And what he would argue in his group at McGill would sort of say it's an ongoing developmental process. And as you begin to think about this notion of professionalism and professional identity formation, you know, professional development is human development, and it occurs at two levels. The first is at the individual level, and I think thinking about the whole person. And I, I think in the past we would sort of consider what are some of the different clinical skills that we have to have as a physician? What are some of the different emotional skills? And as you begin to consider this notion of professional identity and professionalism, it's really whole person development. The second equally important is that development and professional identity formation occurs within the context of an environment. And whether you're within a community-based residency, within a medical school setting, et cetera, this aspect of the collective level that's there uh, is really key and important in your own development. And there's a socialization that sort of goes on and how to, what's the process developmentally that goes on throughout the course of your career. Move to the next slide. And so the overall goal when we think about, you know, what is the end game when you think about professional and professional identity formation is really the moral and professional integration and development of the individual. And this comes out of a report that the Carnegie Foundation issued about six years ago when they really identify that professional identity formation should be a major focus of education, not just for medical students, not just for residents, but an ongoing process, I think, for faculty as well. And for this to occur, I think educators throughout the, the course of their life as a professional educators really need to identify what are some of the constituent uh, areas that are there. And these look at some of the items that are listed here, whether the integration and maturation with their own growth and their clinical competencies. And I think more importantly, how does the individual stay true to their own personal values? And I think we'll see this when we start to dwell and look at some of the boundary issues and guidelines that, are, that come down in the subsequent seminar as well. But also, what are the core values of the profession? Not just the larger profession of family medicine, but also the local environments in your own residency programs and medical school training programs that are there as well. On to the next slide. When you consider this, there are multiple forces and factors that are at play. And I, I think this is something that anyone who's been through medical school, residency training, and even in, as a faculty member can identify. And people talk about the hidden curriculum. Although you may have a very well-designed program in developing professionalism and look at sort of an ethics course or a journal club that's there, there's the, what people have termed the hidden curriculum that's out there. When people hit the wards, when they go into the family medicine centers that's there, what is the real agenda that's out there? And how do those values begin to be displayed that's there as well, that are not articulated, but they lie just below the surface? Equally important and probably more important are the role models and mentors that we all experience throughout the course of our careers and look to those individuals for advice and for counsel. And also the personal experiences that we have and those foundational uh, and uh, reflections and experiences that we have. And if we go to the next slide, it really begins to look at the complexity, and this comes out of, again, Crew's work in uh, Canada, that uh, the complex nature of what goes into that aspect. And again, as you think about this, consider the individual components that are there. What are my individual and my whole person development? And what are the larger contextual and organizational aspects that go into this? And so, again, I think that represents the multiple factors. And I think the key element uh, is what are those socialization? Again, if you're a social scientist, I think you'd sort of pick up on that concept as well. And the arrows, uh, although they're multi-directional, I think really reinforce the reflexivity of this process. Next slide. So if we think about this, how do we begin to understand a process of, by which we undergo this developmental process of identity development that's there? And I think Parker Palmer has always been a good frame, at least for me, and I think for others within medical education. And he uses the term formation that's there. And this aspect of professional identity formation is becoming who you are. And again, there are processes that, that Parker will talk about in a lot of his work that's out there. Of what are some of the activities about reflection, about growth within self, and your elements of service? And again, these will come up, I think, in our uh, context that Randall, uh, some of his work that he's done, and also in Sarah's comments as well but also the importance of entering into sustained relationships. And this is something that Parker Palmer talks about. We do this in the context of our local communities as well. And so thinking about this both on the individual level and both at the contextual level, if we go to the next slide, what are some of those activities that we think about? On the individual level, I think it's really important to think about managing your energies. And I guess I've learned this in the last several years working with faculty within our department and also nationally, a lot of people talk about sort of managing their time. And within business and within management, and this sort of comes out of the Harvard Business Review, I think the key elements are being attentive to where you devote your energy. And if there are a couple different domains that are listed in this slide that I think really begin to be attentive to. So how do you think about your physical energy and what are the requirements that we have in areas around sleep, physical activity, diet? 
what are some of the emotional energy needs that we have and looking at some of the positive and negative emotions that we have and what are the relationships that we have within the context of our work and home life that's there. How do we prioritize our activities and reduce the distractions in an area of the electronic and age, I think it's much too easy to sort of get distracted by competing demands that are out there. And finally, from a spiritual energy standpoint, what are some of the core values? And I think Kierkegaard sort of talks about what is that just one thing that we have as individuals, but also as professionals as well. And if we move to the next slide, from a larger contextual aspect, how do we do this within the, within the frame of our uh, medical school uh, faculty, within their context of our residency, a community-based faculty that's there as well? And again, what Parker would sort of think about, how do we develop and sustain these ongoing communities of formation? What are those individual practices that we have that sort of get articulated in the mission statements that we have within our uh, medical schools or our residency programs that are there? I've seen in different environments that there are compacts that are agreements between physicians and faculty members in the organization that said, okay, here are the expectations and responsibilities that we have as faculty, and here are the expectations that the larger uh, organization has uh, for the faculty members that's there as well. What are the processes that are important to ensure that we're attentive to these developmental activities, such as mentoring processes? Do we have a formal mentoring uh, structure in place? Do we have a formal review process on an annual basis that we're attentive to, not just the performance that's there, so how are we doing in terms of our teaching our clinical skills, but are we attentive to the whole person education? And finally, what are some of the guardrails that are out there to prevent burnout and to begin to look at some of those boundary issues that may arise within the context of our own development as well? So I'm going to stop there and sort of uh, pause, and I think moving on to the next slide, I think is a transition point, and also looking at a, a participant poll. Is that correct, Sarah or Emily? That's correct. Yes, we do have this poll, and I will go ahead and um, launch it. I'm kind of curious and eager to um, hear what you all think about um, maintaining multiple roles in the life of a trainee can conflict with your relationship. Do you agree or disagree? And I've gone ahead and launched it. You can go ahead and enter your, your thoughts on that so far. Um, and then I'll, I'll share the results with you all. All right, those votes are still coming in. Um, thanks for your participation. And give that just a few more seconds, and here we are. I think we're about set. So let's go ahead and here are the results. Um, yeah, it looks like we're, we're people in a lot of agreement. Um, a few a few dissenters, and that's that's great. That's part of the dialogue. Um, thank you for that, and we'll kind of um, move on to this um, transition. I definitely want to encourage anyone who has any questions that they want to share, um, go ahead and send them my way, and I'll, I'll um, ask, I'll, I'll pop them, I'll either answer them or send them to our panelists as well. Great. So now we're going to talk about those roles and what those roles are and um, how they could be in harmony or in um, in disharmony, and to kind of focus our discussion, we're going to have Sarah read through a case study. So I think this is a case in which you see a faculty and relationship that really could exist within any of our programs. So Fernanda is faculty, and Rebecca is a PGY1 resident. Rebecca does very well in residency, but does struggle raising her child as a single parent. During Rebecca's PGY1 year, Fernanda and Rebecca regularly socialize with each other outside of clinic by scheduling playdates for their children. Fernanda and Rebecca live in the same neighborhood and both have dogs. Whenever one of them travels, the other person stops by their house to walk and feed the dogs. They are Facebook friends and have posted on each other's wall. As Rebecca begins her PGY2 year, she continues to excel throughout the year. Later in the year, Fernanda sees Rebecca's son as a patient and removes a wart off his finger. As they both registered for the same conference, they carpool 200 miles to attend. While driving, Rebecca describes difficulties with her ex-husband and from being a single parent. Fernanda listens actively, provides encouragement, and suggests that she sounds like she could be struggling with depression. During the return trip, Fernanda shares that she has had frequent run-ins with the residency program director, and Rebecca shares her similar frustration. Fernanda has a cousin who she thinks would be compatible with Rebecca, so she invites them both over for dinner. Rebecca and the cousin didn't work out. All right. Thanks for reading that. So for Tim and Sarah, we have a couple of questions I'd love to have you discuss with me. 
Uh, the first one is, what are the roles that are created between educators and residents? And kind of using this case example a as a way of looking at those roles. So what do you see happening here with Rebecca and Fernanda? Well, I think you know it's it's a fluid relationship, and again, one of the terms that I've sort of used is you know what are the guardrails? So there's a, some latitude on the highway of life that we have, and throughout the course of the relationships, what are things that sort of prevent us from going off the road? And within the uh, the context of a faculty member and a, and a resident that's there, I, I think being clear about what are the expectations and roles that's there. And what are some aspects? Emotionally, I think there are some elements that, that sort of came to the fro that really raised some questions about boundaries that are there. Um, so those, as I said, I, I, I sort of turned that in thinking about what are some of the guardrails within the relationship. Mm -hmm. so I do sure. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead, sir. That there are potential, I like what you're saying, that there are potential issues within their relationship that would almost be hard to avoid most especially that they're neighbors. Um, and that's something that would be unavoidable in terms of when the resident moves into town and how do you avoid running into your neighbors or socializing with your neighbors or even can you and would that be a responsible choice? Yeah, you know, when I look at the situation, I look at considering guardrails, um, you know, I see roles right here that seem to be creating a role of friendship you know, inside and outside the, re the residency program. Um, they have like a helping relationship where they watch each other's dogs. And there was even a, a brief um, clinician-patient relationship where um, Fernanda, you know, did a, a minor procedure on, on Rebecca's uh, child. Um, and so those are kind of some, maybe some of the non-teaching roles. And then it, um, obviously intimates about um, there's maybe an advising role where Fernanda is, is a key faculty in, in Rebecca's life. There's obviously teaching and evaluation happening at the same time. What would you consider to be the primary and secondary roles in this case study, but also more generally within um, the resident and um, faculty relationship? You know, I guess what I think about that, what are the expect expectations and sort of the proscribed or prescribed um, activities that are there? And you know, the primary role, you know, is faculty and, and resident. And again, it's, it's, there's a wide range of different expectations within, within that designation that's there. Um, you know, you mentioned several Randall that's there in terms of mentoring and, and also in the way of, of a clinician educator that's there. But also, I think implicitly, we haven't really talked about some role modeling uh, for how do you begin to think about or look to somebody who may be living that more integrated life. Yeah, you do get a sense that Rebecca admires Fernanda and sees her as a, as a role model of a thing she could do herself. I think that in terms of what you were saying about role modeling, among things we don't actually know from this case is what is Fernanda's role within the faculty, and um, how young is she? Is she close in age to the residents? Um, when you're discussing a role model, is Fernanda, for example, the young faculty that Rebecca eventually wants to be? Is she the person she wants to model herself after? Not just professionally, but maybe personally also. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't explicit in the case, but also, uh, Fernanda could have been a residency colleague uh, prior to becoming a faculty member in Rebecca's life. And so if, you know, if Rebecca was a first-year resident and Fernanda was a third-year resident, they would have had a, a very different role um, in their first years together. So let's um, maybe skip the next two questions because I think we're going to get to those more in depth later in the discussion. So this next slide is of a model um, that um, I helped to create with some colleagues. It was published in STFM's journal earlier this year. What we did is we did a grounded theory study uh, um, with uh, faculty members from across um, the United States. Grounded theory is a, um, a qualitative methodology in which the research focuses on creating hypotheses rather than testing hypotheses. And so the intent in a grounded theory study is to kind of go 
um, talk with people who have a shared experience and, and often a shared um, uh, quandary or kind of an obstacle and um, going straight to the source of uh, of the participants who we call stakeholders, people who have, you know, who are involved in the situation, and asking them directly and openly about, you know, what's your experience, and what do you understand, what what have you seen, what are your beliefs about the situation, and so we asked um, we ha um, the people from across the country, both physicians and behavioral science faculty, you know, what are your roles that you play in residents' lives, um, what are some of the non-official roles but common roles that are also developed with residents. And then we ask them questions about how do you um, navigate those different roles, and are they usually more harmonious or, or more in conflict? And then we ask people to give us examples of conflicts that might occur. And so this uh, model uh, it, um, is set up as a balance, and so the faculty member is the, 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 the scale or the balance. And on the left side are the primary roles, which our stakeholders defined as being a role model, an advisor, a teacher, a supervisor and an evaluator, and um, going from top to bottom, the the roles tend to be um, less structured and less formal early on, but and by the end, by evaluator, it's a very formal role. Um, it's more prescriptive and um, and it has more of a, a broader outcome on the on the person's um, status within the residency. People also described a lot of secondary roles. Um, which you'll see on the right-hand side, we call them friendly colleague, wellness supporter, and helping hand. You'll see that each of those um, blocks has a little hook that could have a weight added to it, either a weight of disengagement or enmeshment. Disengagement would mean that um, the faculty member is choosing not to really invest in this role at all. And so rather than being a friendly colleague, they could be more aloof and, and uninvolved. Or enmesh would be they're kind of investing too much in the secondary role and um, it, it might cause conflicts for the primary role. So from the friendly colleague level, that could be coming like a best friend, um, some of the things we might, we, we might be seeing with Fernanda and Rebecca. Or even in more egregious situations, it could be a, a, a romantic relationship. Uh, wellness supporter, the next one, was looking at you know, being concerned about the person's well-being, their kind of um, biopsychosocial wellness. And, and again, disengaged would mean that you are um, uninvolved in that, and it's not important to you. you your, your approach is much more about just kind of um, doing your job and, and just kind of sucking things up. Um, and mesh would be that maybe you you became a, a primary care physician in this resident's life, or you deliver her baby. Those would be more of a, a heavily involved um, role. And then um, the last one is helping hand. This would be just kind of showing concern about uh, um, about their kind of their financial and um, social well-being. Do you help them move in when they move to town? Um, do you recommend a hair salon for them? Um, those, those would be more, more of a balanced approach. But more enmeshed might be, do you um, have a financial relationship with them? If you have a side business doing um, disability exams, do you sign a contract with the resident to do this for you? Do you sell them your house? Do you rent them your house? Things like that where you'd be um, no longer having the teaching roles primary, but more of the secondary roles might might be primary. And one thing that was clear in our, our research was that people were saying over and over again, the secondary roles are very important and and, and can be central. And um, in some situations, getting more of an enmeshed relationship can be very beneficial to both faculty and resident. But it's all good as long as it's going well, but you never know when things are going to go poorly. And, and if the, the resident um, starts to struggle, might fail a rotation, um, that could cause problems if you're more on a friendly level with them. Or if um, you're renting the house and the house burns down, or you're delivering the baby and there's a complication in the, in the delivery, that puts you in, in a place where your secondary role um, might take primacy over the primary role. So um, this next, we're going to do another participant poll looking at um, when you consider the culture of your teaching environment, which response best describes the nature of the roles that are maintained between faculty and trainees. And there's one example that would be more of a disengaged type of um, culture. Uh, one would be more balanced, and then one would be more enmeshed. And we're curious as to how you see the culture of your own teaching environment. All right, so this is Emily. I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll for you all so that you can um, respond with how you feel that 
in your own environment you've seen the roles between faculty and trainees. And I know that we've got a good number of people here who are not faculty, but we're just curious to see what have you experienced? Do you, do you see clear boundaries or disengagement or enmeshment more frequently? And we'll give you a few minutes as you um, respond to some of those questions, um, especially as it relates to the um, slide that we were just going over um, and how those roles kind of play out. All right, given just a few more minutes as those votes do continue, a few more seconds, how about, as those votes continue to come in, and I'll go ahead and, and show what we've got so far um, with you all. Um, interesting, we've got a pretty good balance here. Um, uh, it sounds like about 50% of you feel like faculty maintain clear boundaries, which is really great, um, but we've also got um, strong representation from um, those who feel that faculty remain fairly disengaged from trainees and that um, faculty are very involved in trainees. Like I think we've got a really great representation just with our webinar attendees just at the moment here. Good. And that was pretty similar to what we experienced in our in our in our research, that people are generally satisfied, especially with their own uh, boundaries, um, but generally also with their um, their faculty the, the residency environment. Um, we found there were some differences, broadly speaking, between physician and behavioral science faculty. Um, physician faculty were less likely to limit involvement in secondary roles. There's definitely a, a tradition of um, faculty and physicians taking care of th themselves in the residence and seeing that as being kind of almost a venerable role of I demonstrate um, my clinical care by providing care to residents. Um, we also found that um, physician faculty are are more likely to rely on their own um, experience and ethical compass rather than um, a, a hewing to specific ethical guidelines. And in fact, looking at the literature, there are far fewer ethical gu ethical guidelines for these relationships that are promulgated from like the AMA or AFP or STFM um, than there are from the guilds of the behavioral sciences like psychology and family therapy and social work. They would be much more prescriptive on that side. And so people would often say, well, I'm not a behavior scientist, and so I know they have these clear expectations, but in my role, it's very different. Um, size and context were also very important. Uh, people were very clear that in rural settings, that um, it's more common to have um, more of the active involvement in many aspects of the person's life, um, and that was almost seen as being inevitable. If there weren't other options for health care, if um, there weren't great options for housing, if the main social environment was the residency, it seemed like it would be um, more likely that there would be multiple roles at the same time. And also people would say that um, if we're training uh, physicians for rural environments, that's actually probably good training to be exposed to that because it'd be hard to avoid that in your eventual work environment. Um, and that uh, the more you were involved in a larger system or a university system, again, the more likely they were, they were to have formal policies and procedures in place around social media or around providing services or around you know, these multiple role relationships, whereas smaller community-based programs tend to be uh, more free-flowing and, and didn't really have a formality to it. If I can just chime in there, Randall, this is Emily, and um, I think that's fascinating how you've kind of um, progressed through that information about the different contexts and how that tends to play out. Um, we had a um, attendee submit the question right when we first did our um, our example, our case study with Fernanda and Rebecca. He asked, "Is this truly a realistic possibility in a program?" As a practicing psychologist, I cannot imagine allowing such a dual relationship. Um, which I thought was pretty interesting. It really fits into what you're saying about the different types of programs having very different experiences that way. Panelists, did you want to respond to that at all? I'd like to. Um, I came into my faculty job in a program where I was not a resident, but among the things that attracted me to my job was that I actually was friends with two of the residents prior to my taking the job, they were third year residents in, during my first year in faculty. And I had established friendships with them. However, it's almost impossible to completely avoid being in the position of being their faculty, their teacher. I know I stayed out of mentoring positions with them. And because I'm mainly pre-doc faculty, that helped. 
but I know that I worked with them on the inpatient service and I know I did OB deliveries with both of them because it was impossible to avoid. And yet I didn't let my friendships with them go through that year. That makes a lot of sense. It's a complicated kind of um, multiple roles, primary and secondary, happening there. Yeah. You know, and again, uh, th that question came from a psychologist, and psychologists and other guilds from the mental health perspective would have very clear boundaries um, as ethical codes. And, and I would again say that that's not the same perspective from the AMA. I actually talked with SDSM leadership, and they were told that they could not actually um, have rules that way, and the SDSM had actually been um, threatened to be taken to the qu a court environment because of kind of expectations they were building um, around, you know, these are, are adults who have the freedom to choose what they want to do. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't um, beliefs and best practices, and, and we'll have Sarah share some of those around uh, if you are inevitably going to have some of these shared roles, what do you do? Um, I'm a family therapist, and so I do tend to have more clear roles. Like in our clinic, um, it's against um, clinic policy for me or anyone on our integrated behavioral health team to uh, provide direct services to a, um, a staff member or a family member of a staff member. However, we do have uh, family members coming to our group medical appointments because um, we consider that's more of a, an arm's length relationship where it's not an intimate, close working relationship. And so even if we have clear boundaries, there are still going to be some gray areas where you're having to figure out, is this okay or not for me? You know, is, is that an explicit, uh, there's a negotiation process that goes on, I think, whatever, however you land in terms of enmeshed versus disengaged that's there. And I guess the question I would have, is that something that's always articulated among the different parties, or is it something that there's sort of a, uh, a uh, implicit understanding, and my sense is, I don't have any data to support this, is that it, there's a wide spectrum, and perhaps where people get into problems is, is not being explicit enough about where those boundaries lie. And, you know, somebody, person A may have an expectation of, well, here's the nature of the relationship, and person B may say, well, no, without having, uh, you know, as I said, that being clearly laid out. Yeah, you got that impression with Fernanda and, and Rebecca that they weren't really being explicit about what they would and wouldn't do. You know, is it okay to talk about the program director between a faculty member and a resident? Is it okay to set a resident up on a date with a family member? You know, those are things that they might want to have been at least talking about if they were going to do, um, but but never doing that without having said, you know, my role as faculty, your role as resident, we have this great opportunity, you know, but what are the implications and how can we have these guardrails so that uh, we can maintain my primary role as being a faculty member? Sarah, do you want to go on to the professional boundary slides? Yes, as long as we don't have any other questions. We haven't received any other questions um, related to the content so thus far, so I think okay. we're good to go so far. So I think now we're going to move on to a little more about the availability and then the practical application of ethical codes. So first, we want to talk about what standards are available. And the first thing I think you have to ask is, what's available at your own department or your own institution? Is there an unspoken assumption of behavior, or is there a codified document that governs the behavior between faculty and students uh, or residents? Um, the AMA has a code. It's vague. Uh, it places a lot of authority on the physician to self-monitor for potential ethical conflict. However, um, as was pointed out earlier, behavioral health providers who may have um, more rigid codes within their own specialties uh, in primary care see that their colleagues uh, make decisions that, while they're within the bounds of the AMA code, um, may not be commonly accepted, for example, within the behavioral health discipline. Uh, most ethics codes are pretty specific about dual relationships, for example, teacher and friend. Uh, for, with trainees, but assume that the trainee is of the same discipline as the faculty member. However, given uh, that most current curricula include or are starting to include both collaborative care and collaborative training, uh, most ethical guidelines fall a little short because they don't take into account the interprofessional models uh, for health education and training. Uh, next slide.
So if we talk about actually maintaining the boundaries, maintaining physical and emotional boundaries uh, is a developmental achievement. Um, a lot of us with our professional training haven't actually developed these skills. And it is a skill that requires development. Everyone doesn't naturally know exactly what they're supposed to be doing. Um, boundary maintenance itself requires abstract thought. It requires the ability to reflect, to think about your own behavior, uh, to be aware of the situation that you're in, able to assess yourself and remove yourself if necessary. Um, faculty relationships are by nature not equitable. Uh, not only is there the power differential that we're all keenly aware of, but there's also uh, the lack of reciprocity. There can be trust and fiduciary responsibilities. Um, and if these are not spoken explicitly, as we were just talking about in the case, um, they certainly are, can be difficult for that self-observation, being able to actually see your own behavior. Uh, next. So I think if we look along this spectrum, we can sort of see that on the left-hand side, we have the things that are much more private, much more internal, and unlikely to necessarily provoke a problem. And then if we go all the way to the right, the things that are highlighted in red, so financial exploitation, sexual contact, intimate relationships with our learners, I think most of us look at that and say, well, clearly that is, there's a boundary that's being crossed there. Um, however, I think if that's not explicitly stated within your program, that maybe that isn't everyone's ethical code. And that by saying, well, obviously that's true, we don't need to write that down, you are kind of overlaying your own ethical code onto the other people in your program. And as a matter of fact, uh, some of the items that are listed under crossings, so interacting outside of the teaching context, reciprocating hugs, a lot of these I think many people do sometimes even without thinking. Um, you would say, well, these feel very normal to me, whereas if you actually look at private thoughts and fantasies, that may actually feel to some people like a greater violation of a boundary. Uh, next. So some red flags to be aware of, things that when you are self-reflecting, you may want to take a step back and say, where am I in this boundary? Where am I in this relationship? So emotional overstimulation, so very strong attraction, but also the opposite, very strong repulsion from something. Um, making unusual or unusual requests for action. So I normally wouldn't do this, but for you, I'll do something or assigning special status to someone. Um, disclosing role discordant personal information. This, interestingly, isn't always wrong. I know that myself, I, I, I will do this sometimes if it's important, if I've deemed it important in the relationship. Um, but you have to be aware of the circumstances and ask yourself, why are you sharing that piece of information to what end? Um, intense feelings of strong emotional conviction, so it just is. Um, this feels a little like the teacher equivalent of because I said so. Um, let's see. Reluctance to share your interpersonal interaction with colleagues. You've had a conversation, you've had an interaction with a learner, and when you do that self-reflection, you find that maybe I don't want to tell other people about it. And then you have an opportunity to say, well, why? What occurred during that interaction? What was said? And how can I do it differently? Um, because the result of that could be that others will question that interaction. So when others question the interaction, again, the opportunity for self-reflection presents itself. Next. So the road to hell. It, yes, paved with good intentions. Most of the boundary problems do begin with good intentions. So wanting to be giving, caring, supportive, funny, sometimes out of a desire to be helpful or to please someone. Or, for example, we talked about earlier, 
to provide medical care to residents, to family members of residents. And then it's, you need to remember, so boundary transgression can result from unintentional reenactment of relational scripts from your past. So this can lead to loss of present time orientation, loss of the context of your role, uh, recognizing some emotional vulnerabilities and needs. But it's also important to recognize that this can be completely normal and valid in other contexts. Next. So how to stay out of trouble. One, accept that all of us have the ability and the potential to violate a professional boundary. I do, everyone does. Um, to be able to see that there can be a slippery slope in these relationships and to learn to identify those warning signs we were talking about. And then also to realize that your boss, your institution, your state medical board have legitimate expectations for your conduct um, and that they have consequences for violations. Next. So how, how to prevent, what can you do? So this really goes back to that need to self-monitor for prevent potential conflict but also to be able to consider interactions after they've already occurred to see if they can be prevented in the future. So mindfulness being the ability to reflect on your own state of mind and emotions in that moment. So thinking, why did I do that? Why do I think that? What did I say? Did I say it appropriately? Were the right people there? so many questions that can make you aware of your own behaviors. Um, important to learn to read the, your, the signs of your own distress, your own vulnerability, so things like sleep deprivation, uh, feeling unappreciated or feeling desired, um, feeling lonely and how these might interact with those boundaries and with the relationships you have with your learners. And then it's also important to maintain a social support system, which can be easy to say, well, I have all of these faculty around me, but it really is important to also include friends outside of medicine um, and to include professional mentors who can give feedback and who you can approach to discuss those things that you see in yourself. And sometimes that does mean identifying for yourself your own mentors, uh, which can unfortunately be a trial and error process. So Sarah, it's, it's Randall. I, I think your discussion of mindfulness is, is right on. And a question that I often encourage people to think about is, um, what am I doing right now? And I'm in a situation, and I want to ask myself, what am I doing right now? And I think that's a multi-leveled question. One is, you know, if I look at my behavior frankly and candidly with some introspection, what is my motivation? You know, am I focusing on teaching? Am I focusing on my own self-interest? Am I focusing on the, the well-being of the learner or my own well-being? But also, what am I doing right now? What is my role here? Is my role to be an advisor? Is it to be a teacher? Is it to be an evaluator? Or is it to be, in this moment, a support person? And to kind of have that self-analysis um, of what's my role right here and am I staying true to that role in this moment? I have to agree with that. I think that one of the other things that happens is because there are so many conflicting roles and you can be asked to serially serve in multiple ones, sometimes even in the same interaction, that sometimes it's worth, even in the middle of the interaction, saying out loud, you know, I really was thinking about this from the perspective more of a colleague rather than your teacher, your mentor someone who's evaluating you, let me go back and actually think about this from a different perspective. I think that sometimes making the interaction aware, the, the other participants aware of what you're thinking is important. Mm -hmm. And with that same discussion, you know, getting back to uh, different discrepancies in power in the relationship, you know, and, you know, it, in my role as an advisor or an evaluator, I, I do have great power. 
and am I using that um, power differential um, in a benign way or is it a self uh, aggrandizing or self um, beneficial way? I also think yep. that um, we talk we talk a lot about residency. I work more with medical students, and it's important for me sometimes to step back and think about the difference between the way that the power differential would be perceived between me and a medical student to that student, as opposed to between me and a resident. Um, I I think there's a much much wider power gap with students who are still concerned about things like grades and success and getting jobs in a way that sometimes the residents aren't. Yes, yeah, so I was going to comment about the mindfulness. I think that's really a critical skill and it's one that's developed I think through all of our, our professional and personal lives that are there as well. But the aspect of beginning to tag why do I think that's important but what's, what need is this addressing? Because I think in those different domains you know, is it really just is it a functional need that I have? You know, to walk the dog that's there. Is it is it an emotional need that's being addressed? Is it is it a physical need that I have that's there? And you know, just beyond the uh, the why, but what are the what are the uh, the you know, the subconscious sometimes the context that's there? And you're right, that's done within the context of a larger community that's there because a lot of times we are a little bit more blinded in terms of our own strengths and our own vulnerabilities. We have one last slide about what STFM can do to help, and I think this is for Emily. Yeah, that's right. So this is Emily, and I just want to encourage all of you. Um, I really enjoyed hearing um, your conversation as you talk about what does that mindfulness look like. Um, if any of our attendees want to send in any questions, I'm going to go through some of the information on this slide, and then we have a few moments that we can take advantage of. If you have a burning question that you want to ask our panelists, I'll be able to share those with them um, here towards the end. Um, but just to talk a little bit about um, how can STFM help, and um, we just want you to know we've got we've got such a broad audience um, attending this webinar, um, but there are a lot of resources on STFM just as a professional organization and association um, that we do try to address some of these issues of professional identity. Um, and so definitely take a look at first and specifics. Um, if you go to STFM.org and you look under our resources tab at the top. If you go ahead and click on that, and if you are one of our new faculty members, um, somebody who's recently become a faculty um, in any role, um, go ahead and take a look. We have a lot of, um, we actually have a um, 14 brief articles on some things that you might want to know as a new faculty member. They're very practical, um, just hands-on information. And I've really enjoyed going through those myself just to see what kinds of things you might need to know, especially in that first year or two. Um, also, as you have questions about your professional identity, be sure to take advantage of the STFM Resource Library. Um, if you Again, if you go to STFM.org or if you just Google STFM Resource Library, it's actually a separate, um, pretty robust website in which we have just uh, hundreds and thousands of resources, whether those are handouts, um, PowerPoint pre presentations from past conferences. And if you type in a subject that you have a question about, whether it's evaluation or um, feedback or any of the number of things, you can go ahead and find a lot of resources for educators there. Um, also just to be aware of um, for our audience, um, familymedicinecareers.com has open positions for educators and researchers in family medicine. Um, we've got a pretty robust listing if you're ever kind of interested in finding out what's out there. Um, also wanted to let you know about Emerging Leaders, which is a fellowship that SCFM provides, the year-long fellowship offering training tools and support for new faculty who are interested in leadership roles. It's really kind of a springboard um, for somebody who wants to kind of figure out their tra career trajectory and figure out how leadership might look in that. Um, you finish a project in this fellowship and um, at your program. So it's pretty hands-on that way. And of course, we want to encourage everyone to think about attending the STFM annual spring conference with all the networking and mentorship opportunities that are there. That's the most you know, we've got fantastic presentations there, but everyone always talks about the mentorship that you're able to gain there. And so you can maybe see models for you, some, some roles of um, people who might be farther along the path than you are. Um, and last but not least, we do have um, a program that we're coming out with, I believe, in spring of next year, spring 2017. 
We are working on a residency faculty fundamental certificate program. For those of you who are residency faculty, it's um, going to cover a broad array of about 25 topics, including professional identity and boundaries um, and, and online module format. Um, self-directed lessons and exercises for that foundational training. Um, and so that's that. If we want to go on to the next slide, I'm curious to know, do any of you still have questions that you'd like to submit or to ask our panelists? Or panelists, did you have um, any anything in particular that you'd like to um, cover before we wrap things up here? I can tell you that I haven't received any questions from the audience at this moment. If you do have questions, you can also feel free to send them to me um, at ewalters, W-A-L-T-E-R-S, at sdfm.org, and I can share them with our panelists if you have follow-up questions after this webinar. Uh, we do have someone who said, thanks for a good discussion, and I, I agree, panelists, that was uh, so fun to listen to. Well, um, without further ado, um, if you want to go on to the, the next slide, um, I'll let you know that we're sending out a post-webinar survey just to find out um, what you learned. And um, we're just eager to, to kind of measure, are we, are we hitting the right topics? Are we, are we helping you out where you're at right now? So we will send out a brief survey by email. And I would really appreciate it if you uh, have take a moment just to answer just a handful of questions and send them back to us. That would be fantastic. Um, thank you. We've got our references on our final slide. I want to let everyone know that we will be, um, this has been recording, and that we will be posting this webinar recording um, on our website under online resources and webinars. You'll find our faculty for tomorrow web series. Usually within about 24 hours, we'll be um, posting this recording online. So you can uh, watch it again and go through these slides at your, at your leisure. Um, Pamela, anything else you'd like to add? It's been a pleasure being with you today. I agree. It was a fun discussion and a really important topic. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it, especially as new faculty myself. Wonderful. Thank you all. I've really enjoyed our conversation today. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs>